Good afternoon on my behalf as well. My name is Lena Bastapu. I am assistant professor uh, in the area of gender, peace and security here, here at the Swedish Defense University. I will be chairing this panel um, and we'll be quite strict timekeepers, so, <laughs> so be aware <laughs> um, and uh, prepare yourself. In our panel today, uh, let's start from, from Annick. Um, Annick Wibben is Anna Lind Professor for Gender, Peace and Security, and, and of course, internationally known expert of feminist perspectives uh, on security, wars, and militaries. Welcome, Annick. Um, Claire Hutchinson, uh, whom we have a very, very um, special um, delight of hosting today, is an expert in women, peace, and security with over 20 years of experience in this arena. Claire has, for instance, worked as NATO Secretary General Special Representative for, for Women, Peace and Security, as well as, as, well as the Senior Gender Advisor with the United Nations for over a decade. So huge, huge experience here. Well, you are warmly welcome. And last but not least, we have Magnus Christiansson, senior lecturer in war studies here at the Swedish Defense University. Um, Magnus is an expert of defense policy, uh, Baltic Sea security, as well as NATO. Warm welcome, everyone. So in this panel discussion, we will have three, three larger questions um, and about five minutes per person to answer these questions. Um, do notice, please notice that there will be a possibility to ask questions as members of the audience um, after the panel. Um, so, so keep that in mind while you are listening to our uh, panel members. So let's go to the questions. Um, if we can start from Annick and then Claire and, and then Magnus. So if, we, um, if you consider your area of expertise, um, how do you see the current international response to Russia's aggression and the ongoing war in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you, Lena. Uh, also should mention Lena as part of the gender, peace and security team here at the Swedish Defense University that is co-organizing this event. So um, thank you for accepting the invitation to be our moderator. So I have a lot to say. I'm going to try to stick to five minutes, but um, I think one of the things that is really important um, from my perspective here, or from my maybe a broader feminist perspective, is that um, you know while we have seen sort of a variety of feminist responses um, from around the world, from you know abroad in Europe as well. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things that have come from uh, local and regional feminists um, in Ukraine, because um, a lot of the response that has sort of transpired maybe internationally has been a little off, I think. Um, and I think this is partly because feminists in general have a hard time actually dealing with war. Um, we can talk more about that. Um, of course, feminists have been very good at sort of pointing to the gendered underlying causes of war, the human consequences of war, um, how militarisms, plural, are gendered, um, how gendered and sexualized violence is a really sort of, yeah, sadly important key recurring part uh, of war and, and sort of beyond war more generally. Um, but I think one of the things that has been missing a little bit from the international response has to sort of take into account also the, the sort of ways in which this is a context of what we might call broadly Russian imperialism, right? So a decolonial perspective has been missing. And this is something that a lot of feminists from the region, from Eastern Europe more generally, and also um, some of the Nordics have been pointing out. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of a, it's been striking for me to see how this international response, international feminist response has been not really intersectional, even though we've had so much, um, you know, so many conversations about. So what are feminists from Ukraine and from the region saying? First of all, they are saying, help us defend ourselves. Don't lecture us about feminism and peace or feminism and militarism. We know these things. We have actually been fighting locally um, on all of these issues. 
Um, but right now we need to be able to defend ourselves because if we are dead, then none of these other things are gonna happen. So send us weapons, close the skies. So sometimes maybe feminism can also be asking for those things. They also have said, uh, help us make sure that women's voices are heard, included. There are women and queers fighting on the front lines, supporting the war effort. Um, women are just as much actors and agents. Um, and they should be there in the press, in the public, and definitely also in the negotiations. There needs to be meaningful participation. Um, and if you are a little bit familiar with the literature, you know what meaningful is very important. Uh, speak about how the war is affecting different populations. Um, women, gender non-conforming people, old people, young people, people from different communities, such as the Roma people, um, people who are displaced internally in Ukraine, people who cannot move because either they are in towns under siege, like Mariupol, um, or cannot move because of their gender, age, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and help us document human rights violations, help us get attention out about sexualized violence. This has become, of course, an issue um, after Bucha was liberated in other places, but this is something that has been known. It has been ongoing. Um, for the last, you know, since, since Russia first um, went into Ukraine. Um, there are consequences, immediate consequences, need for reproductive um, rights, for care. Um, so this needs to be taken into account in the humanitarian um, response as well. Um, but it also, there needs to be a reckoning uh, in terms of criminal court, um, et cetera. And it's not just sexualized violence, I wanna make that very clear, that's important, but it's also um, information that has come out about forced relocation from um, particularly people who have been moved from uh, occupied areas to some of the remotest corners of the former um, Soviet Union. So broadly, um, what I'm hearing from uh, Ukrainian and other local feminists is listen, stand in solidarity, support local feminist or organizations as well. You can find this information. I'll tweet something out later as well. Um, and neutrality in a way is a privilege, right? Always, but particularly now. That was probably more than five minutes. But it was perfect. It was Yay. just perfect. Thanks, I think. <laughs> um, Claire, could you maybe um, continue? Uh, I Yes, don't. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I could make it easy and just say everything she said. Yes. <laughs> um, I think in terms of the response, the response of the international community is to be expected, generally, uh, in terms of its uh, uh, support in military, <clears throat> excuse me, support in funding. What I don't necessarily think has been, uh, has been adequate is the gendered response, the, the integration of the women, peace and security perspective. And in the response on a number of levels, I think we have some great challenges. Uh, this is not a new war. This is a war that's been going on. And so where was the preparation of women, peace and security? I know our individual nations have done a lot and including Canada, my own country, um, has worked with both the police and the military. Uh, many NATO nations have worked over the years. But while we have spoken quite uh, largely about women, peace and security and deployed gender advisors and worked, um, it seems to be missing. And it's missing in the most important areas. Even before the war, 1.5 million displaced internal um, uh, people, majority of women and children, uh, high numbers of HIV, uh, a huge population of Roma displaced, and these are all undocumented. So when it comes to war and you have people leaving or fleeing, when you have, an, as in any conflict, you're not documented, you can't get any support. You can't, and we've heard this, many women cannot cross the border because they have no documentation. This should have been addressed. 
Um, we have many things that should have been in play. A, a, a very large elderly population. So a lot of the elderly women uh, won't leave and can't leave. And I think what it's also exposed is the incredible gendered norms that is in Ukraine. Um, the idea, and we've seen this with the with the uh, the men having to stay to fight and the women leaving with children, um, that the gendered norms have been exacerbated, the caring. We've also seen the gendered norms exacerbated with the imagery of women, uh, the beautiful woman with the gun. Um, the imagery is, is, is making this so that there's this real disconnect between equality for women as, as, as equality as genuine agents in, in fighting, as opposed to the sexualized imagery, which I find incredibly disturbing. Another response which I question is in terms of sanctions and the sanctions that hit, as we know, the hardest or the lowest socio-demographic. It is in any nation that has had sanctions. And I'm not saying the sanctions are wrong. I'm not, I'm not questioning that. But what I, do, what I do believe is that we have to think more broadly about who exactly, um, where does this go? Because the rich are always um, protected. So the sanctions as a, as a response is a question for me in a gendered, uh, gendered meaning. And then we've seen the output, of course, increased military spending. Now, I'm not, obviously I worked with NATO, so I'm not against the military. And I do believe that feminism and militarization don't have to be loggerheads, but overspending has to be, have, uh, has to be managed. Because what I worry about is the response in, in over-militarization takes away from the human security aspect. So protection of, of civilians, protection of women and girls, protection of children, cultural property protection. This is one area we have not heard a lot about. And, and, and this is immediate as well. And I think media's response has been appalling in some places on how they are putting the narrative of this forward. But how do you protect culture and social cohesion, which has been attacked, frigidly attacked? Um, and then the cultural property protection of women and women's identity. None of this has been addressed. And so while we have years, 22 years of women, peace and security, where is it? I mean, why are we not taking hold of this as an international community and applying the lessons we have been learning for 22 years? Uh, it's not enough just to have a policy and a resolution. We have to apply them. And this is a moment in time when we can do real response in the way we should be by applying the principles as well as the practical elements of women, peace and security. Thank you, Claire. Powerful. And, and I think echoing much what uh, Annick was saying here. Um, Magnus, mm -hmm. uh, could you continue, maybe pick something, pick up something that was said? Or Yes, well, I, I think that uh, 24th of February was an earthquake in European security and or in, in Western security policy and strategy. Uh, not, as Claire said, not because it was the start of an invasion and not because it was a challenge of the security order, because that died in 2008 and 2015 when Georgia and, and Ukraine were not allowed to choose their own paths. So, but, but the earthquake was in three dimensions. First of all, the, the sanctions, um, um, where I think the West actually managed to sanction just about anything that did not directly hit what actually drives uh, the Putin machine and drives the invasion. Uh, the second uh, part has been to raise defense budgets, but there, and, and this has been labeled here as militarization, but I would say, well, let's see how much of militarization this will be in the end. So there's been a lot of, lot of bragging about uh, raising defense budgets, um, Germany not least. Uh, but we'll see, uh, and we, there are many other priorities, and this will actually be just one of many things, not, not even in security-wise, that will compete uh, on spending. But I think the, the third uh, substantial response has been to directly support uh, the Ukrainians with arms. Now, the, the American uh, decision not to engage directly in this conflict has been very, very instrumental in the uh, Finnish NATO debate, and we will return to that question later. Uh, but it has also shown that the Americans have started very slowly uh, 
because of fear of escalation and the Europeans actually were very hesitant, but American leadership soon started to pour in more and more weapons. And now even the Germans are, are handing in um, um, Panzer Haubitz, which is the kind of heavy equipment that you need in order to retake your, you reclaim your country. Now, so there's clearly a sort of a, a mission creep here. And I think that this situation is very dangerous for, for two reasons. There's a book called Sleepwalkers, which is about the First World War. And I think if you look at the grand strategy picture here, there's a lot of sleepwalking uh, in all the major capitals here. In, in the United States, there is this idea that uh, the United States can be standoff uh, to make a clear distinction between its engagement and, and further escalation. There's a sleepwalking in, in, uh, in, that, uh, in Moscow. They believe that they're winning this war. Uh, and in China, uh, there is this idea that, or this hope that this will just go away and that China will not have to take side in this conflict. And so it has all the recipes for, for uh, something very, very nasty. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, is, of course, how do you respond to an escalation? And here I believe that it's, it's one thing to emotionally be, be appalled by all the images and send in the weapons. But what do we actually do if there is a serious escalation? No one wants to discuss this in Brussels. Uh, if you, it's still, if you want to clear a room, uh, if you want to discuss weapons of mass destruction. So there's basically no policy, but a lot of emotions. And I think this is, that's a sort of a total recipe for a very dangerous situation. Thank you. Anything you want to pick up um, on what was said here to the first question? Do you want to comment or add? Um, sure. There's lots to say, but um, <laughs> if you yeah, just a few, yeah, no, no, I think let's go on and yeah. we can we can move okay, on. yeah, okay, let's move on to the second question and then we can we can continue the debate um, afterwards. Um, just a bit of a background to the next question. Um, we have been talking about so-called women, peace, and security agenda here. Maybe not all the audience members uh, are aware of this WPS agenda. Um, which is abbreviation for Women, Peace and Security Agenda. It was launched 22 years ago, as Claire indicated already. Um, uh, in 2000, uh, Security Council adopted um, Resolution 1325, uh, which marked the, the beginning of, of uh, WPS agenda. In the following year, Security Council of the United Nations adopted nine additional um, resolutions um, the, the, the aim was to complement and clarify the agenda. So altogether, these 10 resolutions now uh, for the past 22 years um, are called WPS agenda. What is the aim of these, these uh, resolutions is to encourage equal participation of all genders in international peace and security institutions and practices. So everybody must be involved uh, in this in the tables of power and, and uh, in, in these discussions. So the question is, um, when it seems highly likely now that Sweden and, and Finland, my country of origin, Finland, will join NATO in the near future, uh, we can quite confidently say this, I guess. Um, could you please deliberate on the WPS agenda of NATO? Is there such an agenda in NATO? How does it differ from the UN context. Um, what are some of the challenges of, of the WPS agenda in NATO? Um, and maybe Claire is the natural okay. natural uh, person to start. All answer right. Thank this you. Question. Thank you. Well, uh, it, women, peace, and security in NATO have been closely aligned for many years. Um, first, I mean, Sweden was one of the driving partners of this agenda, uh, as 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 Austria and and the partners themselves taking the agenda from the UN and putting it in an operational sense initially. So the idea that in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, um, and most recently in Iraq, there has to be a gender perspective integrated. So that's always been sort of the underlying um, element of the operational, what we would call effectiveness. Now I question if that's a word that we should use, but um, the operationalization of, of, of any mission. Uh, over the last few years, and when I was at NATO, we looked more at putting it into a strategic, the strategic framework, and introduced three I's, integration, integrity, and inclusiveness. 
which moved it away from operational as it seemed more uh, in line with NATO's role being operations becoming sort of less as a, as a focus. Um, and, and more into other areas like climate change and technology and cyber security, because as the as as security changes and has had and, and up to recently with with uh, what's happened with Russia, we were looking very much at hybrid warfare. We're looking very much at different ways, you know, attacking grids, um, looking at terrorism, looking at how climate change is a security factor. And how does that affect women and men differently? And everything affects women and men differently. And security affects women and men differently. But the problem is, over the years, many people seem to think that a person, a man and a woman, are affected in the same way. And they're not. And so if we want to have robust populations, and this is as Sweden moves forward, and I think you know, NATO and the UN have a lot to learn from, from Sweden. I mean, the first country to have the feminist foreign policy, there's a lot that can be uh, as a lesson learned. But I think what, what can be brought that can be more robust is looking at what I would call the next generation of, of gender and making sure that it's integrated in the security framework of total defense, of total security. How do we all understand security? Women understand security differently. Women see uh, tanks and armored cars as insecure. Men see them as secure. How do we incorporate that into defense planning? How do we look at what does security mean if I live by a river? Men and women see that differently. What does it mean to have soldiers deployed near to you? And so we have to take all of this into account if we want to move forward in any security dynamic, if we want to move forward in any security environment. But as NATO grows in both membership and as security changes, um, and just because we now have some over, you know, a traditional kinetic engagement doesn't mean that the hybrid or the, the, the security threats have changed other. Uh, terrorism is still there, cybersecurity is still there, if not more so. Um, we have to make sure that we have robust responses. And if half the population is missing if from a military or from a response, if half the population is not being engaged in what do they think is fearful or threatening, how can we do a, an adequate, beyond adequate, a successful security strategy? How do we protect our people? And this has been the problem because we've only ever been engaging half the population. And then you go beyond this and look at LGBTQI. How do we make sure that those in other groupings also feel secure? Um, and we have to do a lot more work in it. So NATO has taken us on board. Different to the UN, because the UN is a bigger, um, a bigger organization. The UN peacekeeping has a different response. UN is also not run by consensus in a way uh, that, that uh, the 30 nations and maybe 32 in the near future all have to agree on everything. And in the UN, when you write a policy, you can write a policy without taking it to the Security Council, for example. So you have a lot more leeway in the UN. But the two organizations, as well as the EU and OSCE and others, um, I think have come leaps and bounds over the last 22 years. Uh, the challenge is how to move past just talking about numbers of women into real integration, um, because it isn't just about getting all at a table. It is much more than that. And I feel sometimes we are um, hitting the low hanging fruit in all organizations uh, and saying the right thing, but not always doing the right thing. So, so deeds and not words. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Anik, maybe you can continue yeah. as an expert of WPS agenda. Yes. And I'm going to be a little bit critical. Um, but, you know, your last your last sort of point was definitely also where um, I think I, I wanted to maybe start, which is the sort of disjuncture between the rhetoric, right, and the reality. And that goes for NATO mm -hmm. as much as for many other organizations in terms of commitments to the WPS agenda. Um, you, know, the, you know, there's a lot of nice documents. Um, NATO has stuff on its website that looks fantastic. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and then you start to scratch the surface and then you're like, okay, so what just happened here? Yeah, okay, so there's some numbers of some women somewhere. And you know, somehow it's gonna make operations 
more effective or not, not so much anymore that we're moving away from that slowly, but it's still very much like you know, also something that we see floating around here um, in conversations. Um, so I think that the question of what would it really take, right, to, to sort of move beyond um, those kind of rhetorical commitments. And also, I think, to some extent, um, really think about, you know, many of the contradictions that are within the WPS agenda. And, and there is a huge body of feminist literature on this um, for all the students out there who want some uh, references, uh, hit me up. Um, which basically points out also that, you know, some of the things that we cover under um, this agenda are actually at cross purposes with each other, right? Um, and of course, feminist, uh, I think, analyses of, of war, militarism, etc., have always pointed out that you need to really do this contextually, right? As I was sort of starting off with my remarks today, like we, we have to think about what is happening in Ukraine within the context of uh, sort of Ukraine's history, the history of the region, you know, sort of the responses from the West are striking in that all of a sudden, for example, Ukrainians became white, right? So, I mean, this is sort of in, in the refugee uh, conversation, you know, oh, well, Poland, right? We will take these because they are like us, which is, you know, very, in this case, very close proximity, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that hasn't really been the way, you know, the, the West has really seen Eastern Europe, right? This was not necessarily um, the response, for example, when um, we saw people fleeing from the mm. former Yugoslavia, which by the way, is another one of these blind spots in that, oh, the first time we have war again in Europe. Well, no, actually. So I think we, we forget sort of the history and the context um, way too often. Um, and I think that uh, here, <laughs> NATO and the UN share some some things in, in terms of being sometimes too universalizing um, and um, not having enough maybe regional expertise as well, um, specificity for what is needed. And of course, I actually remember uh, with, don't remember exactly when, but being at NCGM and we have representative here with, with a mission from Ukraine, right? So, I mean, the, there, it's not that these things haven't been happening either that you know the ukrainians haven't also already been training in a way um and implementing parts of this agenda but i guess the question is which parts um what does it really mean um what does it mean at at different times in 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 a conflict or in and sort of um whether it's like you know is it different when we're talking about an actual war kinetic engagement or is it um, different when we are sort of, as you were saying, well, while you were at NATO, you know, you were sort of not really thinking about those things specifically. They seemed a little bit further away maybe. Um, and at this point, um, I think feminist critiques maybe of the agenda in general have gotten a little bit louder, have, have been pointing to this sort of which we've known all along, we've known this for the past 20 years, gender does not just equal women, right? Uh, we need to talk about men and masculinities. We need to talk mm. about sort of uh, LGBTQI uh, communities, et cetera. So um, I think we need to have a better conversation between I think the research community, the activist and practitioner community um, and these organizations mm. because like, these things are not going to move forward unless we have that conversation. And this is why we are here. <laughs> Precisely. Um, Magnus, do you still remember the question? No, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do uh, remember the question, but I'd rather, I think I'd rather listen to a response from, from Claire. Okay. Uh, um, I, I, you know, one of, I think one of the problems is, and, and this, is, this is where we are at with the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, 22 years ago, the agenda was brought to life by these incredible women who were peace activists. And, and that was what it was about. It was about, we need peace and that. And, and to me, this is an essentialist argument, right? That the idea that women are all peacemakers and, they, mm -hmm. and we all hold hands and sing songs to each other or whatever <laughs> we're supposed to do. Um, and I'm being flippant, but, but <laughs> I hope you know I'm being flippant. Um, 
But the idea that it, but it had meaning and it made sense because in that time coming out of, out of the 90s, you know, women were only ever linked to development. They weren't linked to security. It was the first time the Security Council in 2000 ever even had a conversation about having women in a security uh, uh, debate. And so it was, it was really, it was, uh, I remember this, you know, when this was adopted, it was really uh, life-changing for many women. But what has happened over 22 years is it's changed. But unfortunately for some, they haven't changed. Mm. And I think we now have this, this dynamic between two opposing or more opposing groups where some who believe, and I'm a very strong feminist, and I'm an arch feminist from, in many <laughs> cases, and, and I'm quite a rude feminist for many. Um, but the idea is I am also pro-military because I believe as a defense force, they will defend us. And I think what we've got to is, is this, where we cannot agree amongst ourselves. And that also creates this, this outward looking, oh, you women are arguing amongst yourselves. And this, it's building on this, that narrative, which I really hate, right? Where the patriarchy wins in that case. And so the agenda has changed. And if it hasn't, it should. And it doesn't mean we don't need women as peacemakers, people at women at peace tables, absolutely. But we also need to recognize that the security has changed. The world has changed. And if we are only going to say, I need to sit at a peace table and only at a peace table, but I am not going to be part of a military strategy, I'm not going to be part of defense, then we're left out. And we are marginalizing ourselves back into a corner. And I don't think that is the way to move forward. I think there is so much strength in the connection of the feminist movement, no matter what you believe in. And for me, a feminist is any woman or man who believes that they should have the same opportunities. Um, and, and, and the future of women, peace and security. But I also think it's been polarized by the sexual violence agenda, where bringing in the resolutions on sexual violence, which are separate, and have a separate emphasis to women, peace and security has been, I think, ho wholly damaging because you can't have sexual violence without the underlying gender dynamics that allow this to happen, the masculinities that, that, that thwarted masculinity. And so there is so much we can do and so much, we, so much further we can go. Um, and I love the conversations that are critical of my opinion, or we can be critical of each other's because that's what we need to do more of. We need to have more military at the table. We need to have more civilian and men and women who can then say, no, I think this is rubbish. And we can have this genuine conversation because the worst thing you could possibly have is someone stands up and says, I really believe in women, peace and security, walks away and says, what a load of rubbish. Um, and that happens all the time. I want someone to stand up and say, I don't agree with you because then we can have a genuine conversation by changing how we really apply it. And that's what we need to aim for. We need to aim for the higher button there. Thank you so much, Claire. And remember this argument for the questions session. <laughs> um, maybe Magnus, would you like, you would like to reply as well, but just Magnus. No, it's let's fine. Give, it's fine. Let's be. Uh, okay, then if, if Magnus is fine, <laughs> we'll then I'll just ourselves. take the word and then very quickly and then. Very quickly. No, but I, I think what you're saying is really important, right? Um, and we're going to have these conversations yay, this week. But um, also, I mean, I think I want to give one concrete example for, for people who maybe are listening, right? So when we're talking about, um, you know, whether it's Ukrainian feminists or, or others um, saying, you know, we need to be able to defend ourselves, we need to be able, you know, we are already part of um, the defense forces in Ukraine right now, we need weaponry, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot at the same time forget all the knowledge that feminists and, and others have um, sort of contributed to, for example, what kind, what are, what are we talking about when we're putting small arms out, mm -hmm. right? So um, we know that when small arms proliferate, this also, you know, produces a higher likelihood of, of domestic violence and other kinds of violence. So we can, we can do those things at the same time and we must otherwise this kind of agenda is failing, right? So when we're talking about, you were sort of talking about like, militarization, we're talking a little bit about militarization. So Germany, you mentioned Germany, 
my home country, where we're a very international panel here, um, uh, is, is remilitarizing or increasing its defense budget um, as well. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, what does this mean? What does it mean from a feminist perspective? And I think one of the issues here for me is, okay, what, what kind of militarization are we talking about, right? So the first sort of set of money that was given out was spent on jackets, right? And, and other sort of uh, kind of more essential things that had been missing in the, in the Bundeswehr. So, um, okay, uh, maybe we need to be much more specific. And I guess in, in some way, that's what I was saying before as well, that like, we need to be country specific, region specific. We need to be really looking at, you know, what is actually happening? What, what kind of militarization are we talking about? And then that maybe gets back to your point as well. Why are we not talking about sort of certain aspects of, for example, the escalation, if there is an escalation, right? So I think in all of those conversations, I would like feminists, right? And, you know, under the WPS umbrella or not, I don't really care. Like, let's be involved in the conversation. I think we needed feminist defense policies, not just feminist foreign policies. Mm. And feminist peace policies as well. So <laughs> feminist everything. <laughs> everything feminist. feminist everything. I like yes. that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe we ha maybe it's a good thing to remind ourselves time and again that you don't have one single feminism, but feminisms, and we can all coexist and reinforce one another. Magnus, please. <laughs> no, but basically, I think more that I had a have a question uh, connected with this, and that is. How do you see the risk that, because I, the, the day after the war broke out, I, I was in Brussels and um, it was one section before um, the reason why I went there. And, and that section was completely devoted to what the European Union calls the strategic compass. And some senior diplomats um, presented uh, a lot of work that the European Union had uh, been doing on, on an outlook for five, 10 years um, ahead uh, in time. And they didn't comment on the fact that this escalation had actually started. And I, it was one of the things that I, I brought up and that was that maybe this will actually make everything that you've been do, doing, not everything, but many of the things that you've been doing very, very secondary or very, very peripheral. What do you think that the, the risk is that all these issues will be sort of pushed aside uh, in the interest of, of, of national security? I would say it's extremely high, sadly, right? So I think that in general, um, and this you know, has been something actually that yeah, feminists and others have flagged again and again, that in the moment when sort of the crisis hit, right? So the sort of crisis mode of politics usually mm -hmm. means that and these other things are pushed to the side. And we can see it even, and we'll talk about this, I think, in the last question, but like in the debate in Sweden about mm. NATO, right? So in the moment when, when you're talking about um, crisis politics and mm. something must be done now, mm. right? For some reason, I don't think it has to be that way. It's not like the experts aren't sitting around and you could call us up, right? Mm. But it, for some reason in that moment, all this other stuff gets forgotten, right? Um, and it's interesting. There is a, I mean, I have a question as to why this is always the case or so often the case, right? Is it because we just haven't gotten to the point where uh, we are moving beyond the usual suspects in terms of expertise, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Is it because, um, you know, there are still hierarchies of knowledge about who supposedly, right, knows something about defense, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of a puzzle, but I think it's, you know, sort of something that many of us have noticed. And at the same time, we also know that if, you know, feminists or women or others are not involved from the beginning in, for example, the conversation about NATO or in the conversations um, about how to respond to Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we get these new systems, these new institutions that are being built, and they again replicate the same ways of doing things that we know haven't worked, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't, for example, you were talking about feminist peace politics. Well, we, <laughs> time's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you hear me with the other mic? It works. Yes. Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh, you were talking about feminist peace politics. So, you know, clearly we haven't solved the problem of war, 
well, maybe we should try having some more feminist perspectives. Maybe that would work in the future. Who knows, right? We need to try it before we can get there. And this is where I want to now take my panel back to myself. Yes. Um, <laughs> so taking everything that has been said here and, and, and then uh, drawing from what Annex has said, if women, if, if everybody, if all the genders are not included in, in the processes that lead up to uh, all kinds of agreements, such as should we join NATO and what are what are the consequences and what what are the um, conditions? Uh, so the question is, um, how could Sweden contribute to the WPS agenda in the context of NATO? Um, what what is what are the additional value that Sweden could bring? Um, and now, if if and when we are at the negotiation stage. Um, should Sweden, for instance, set certain membership conditions related to the WPS agenda uh, so that uh, gender would be uh, mainstreamed from the start and we wouldn't be out from the, from the important decision making uh, procedures? Magnus, I want to start from you because otherwise, well, I, <laughs> otherwise the, we just take over. Uh, I think it's a, the, the, the question is very typical of, of the discussion. Um, the Swedish NATO discussion, and that is that we, we now are entering a, a discussion about membership, but, but there's all, all these appendices, uh, or all these conditions for uh, NATO membership, and I think that would be, that would be counterproductive in the, in the sense that if you want to get, have uh, objections along the way, that is the shortest way to, to, to go. Um, so, um, however, on the inside, uh, it, it is, if, of course, important to have a policy. Uh, I mean, the, the big discussion in Sweden has always been uh, what is NATO, uh, what is good about NATO, and, and should Sweden apply? But that is, of course, to most people that you, you speak to in Europe, I mean, the, the big question is what kind of policy should you have on the inside? Mm -hmm. What are your priorities? What do you want with, the, with, with your NATO membership? And in that sense, of course, uh, gender is, of course, uh, I would say, a very natural part of the of the Swedish package, so to speak. And I think also that is what is expected uh, of, of many NATO countries that we we bring this perspective in international politics. Now, I think that uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of the, the the Swedish Swedish positioning as a partner has been very much to to confirm our own identity. I believe that one of the big revolutions if, if Sweden joins NATO is that we will need to listen to other countries. Uh, uh, firstly, the Nordic countries. Uh, what security needs do they have? And that will be, be, be a part of our priorities and our, our planning. But I think the, the, the great plus is here that um, at least Finland, Finland um, uh, Sweden and, and Norway have tended to have very like-minded positions when it comes to, uh, among other things, gender issues. So I think that would actually sort of strengthen um, uh, sort of a, a united Nordic dimension in NATO would actually strengthen the 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 um, the, um, the discussion about gender issues uh, in the alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I th and I think uh, that that would not be any surprise to anyone in, in Brussels. I want to have and I want to pose an additional question to you um, before we move on to Claire. Do you think that Finland and Sweden should have gender as part of their I think there, there must be some some negotiations going on between between the two countries right now. Should that be part of the discussion package, uh, Magnus? Well, I mean, the, I mean, the, uh, how do you apply for membership? I mean, yeah. uh, you need to be a democracy. You need to be a part of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty area, and you should contribute to security. Um, then there is a map process, which is a sort of a what, what reforms do you need, uh, and then you're invited, and then there's ratification. After that comes all the discussions about, you know, wh wh what do you really want when we with nuclear issues? Uh, wh what do you, wh what kind of agenda? Are you? I mean, it's a it's a big smorgasbord in the in the alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the best thing to uh, meet objections in Europe and to get very critical questions is that you say, oh, we want to join, but we don't want to. We don't want to defend Turkey. Uh, what do you think the Turkish uh, Parliament, uh, what the Turks will say about that? I mean, it's a so the, uh, if Sweden wants to join, um, um, you, you join in a, an alliance with a package. It's a, it's a short document. Um, every, every Swedish citizen could read it. And then afterwards, you will have a discussion about NATO basis, uh, about your policy for nuclear issues, gender issues, and so forth. 
but that's uh, an agenda forming. And also I think that our security elite needs to get in the game and to understand how NATO works from the inside. Uh, and they better do it quickly because already in June, uh, there's gonna be a very fundamental discussion about the future deterrence policy and basing policy in the Alliance. And if we don't get our act together, I think we're gonna be sidelined by many other countries that, know, that knows how to play the game. Wonderful insights. So we need to learn the game, the rules of the game. You know the rules of the game, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I think Sweden has already contributed. First of all, the first gender advisor to, uh, to um, our Allied Command operations was Swedish. Um, the, head of, um, uh, the head of department for training uh, uh, we have there as, uh, as NCGM. Um, there's already a huge contribution. And, and in fact, you know, Sweden, as well as the other partners, have adopted the NATO policy on women, peace and security. And when you do that, it means that you are obliged to implement the three acts, right? So, so there's already an alignment with, uh, with the policies and principles of women, peace and security in NATO. Um, I, I think one of the dangers though, as, as, and I, I say this from an example of one of the very forward-leaning nations who had not, had not put gender into one of their, their, their documents for the very simple fact because it was so common and that they didn't think they had to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a danger and that's a flag to, to remember because I do think that Sweden is very advanced in comparison to, to some nations. And the idea, because it's common to you, um, you may have to be one of the leading nations who keep pushing because you do need to keep pushing. This is not organic. And that goes back to your question before. Um, you know, in the UN, they still call gender, even today, they call gender and protection of civilians and children and armed conflict the Christmas tree mandates. They still talk as it an add-on to the real issues. And I and that is not unusual in any organization. So um unless it's in the strategic concept for NATO, unless mm. it's in the baseline documents and it's fought for still to this day, mm. we can lose it. Mm. And we see the pushback everywhere in the world. We see the pushback in the US today. We see mm. the pushback in many nations. Because gender equality, we may see it floating around, doesn't mean it's, it's anchored. And unless we keep pushing for this. So I think the, the future um, uh, for NATO continues to be strong, empowered nations bringing forward this agenda. And I think this is where Sweden can play a role. Mm. Um, and not forget, just because it's done naturally here, that it's it's mm. going to be an automatic because you do have to uh, still push. So it's, you know, you know, I do hope to see um, um, Sweden as part of NATO. Um, and I do think that there's a lot that NATO and other, NATO, and, and other organizations can learn, um, but it has to be done genuinely. It has to be done with authentic voice and has to include civil society and women's voices. And a lot of times we forget that. So, um, yeah, the, the women, peace and security agenda, um, there's a lot to be done. And, uh, and I think there is a positive, I'll be positive here. Um, I think there's a positive road forward, but it's a struggle. And, uh, and yeah, so again to Annie. Anik, um, this will be this was our last um, question from from my side for now. Um, so if you can answer to the last question and and then wrap up a bit, and then mm -hmm. we will move on to the audience questions. Yeah. Um, oh, so many thoughts. I mean, I want to also ask you, like, why do you think NATO hasn't said anything to W about the WPS? But maybe we can, you know, in the current conflict. But maybe we can have that conversation later. Um, I mean. On the question of NATO and uh, Sweden, Finland joining, um, what can Sweden bring? I think one of the things that I find really striking is how, you know, I think we know this, that this is something that Sweden has A, already been involved in quite a bit, even though it hasn't been officially part of NATO, kind of like very close collaboration anyway, at least around these issues and some others. Um, but my, my question a little bit is like, and maybe it's because it's so obvious to people here, 
Um, it hasn't really been very much part of the sort of public conversation, right? Um, the whole actually public conversation, I think about Sweden joining NATO has been very, you know, kind of one-sided. I mean, you described it, right? It was mostly about like, oh yeah, what can NATO bring uh, less, maybe the, the other way around and also a little bit um, missing some of like, well, are there other alternatives? Um, you know, is it really, you know, after many, many years of Sweden being neutral-ish, <laughs> another conversation, um, is this the moment to do this, right? Um, there's sort of a crisis politics mentality, I think, in the way in which the debate has gone. So I think that that's, that's something that, you know, uh, partly in response to some of the things we talked about earlier, but also more generally, is a little bit worrying. The timeline is very rushed. Um, because of, again, it's the crisis moment and the crisis moment often leads out the other things. Um, and so in that, in that, I wonder whether, you know, there has been enough time to really think about, you know, Sweden is already collaborating on so many of these things. Does it need to move to the next step? Maybe it does, right? But we, uh, we are now sort of tumbling towards that in a rather fast way without thinking about that. And also, I think some of the things that... Um, uh, feminists and other scholars uh, and activists have pointed out to, you know, what does it do to Sweden's role um, in the world more generally to be part of NATO? Because Sweden has sort of carved out for itself a sort of role as a negotiator, a role as a advocate for gender in different other ways, uh, whether it's development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is there something that Sweden maybe might lose by becoming part of this alliance, which, you know, let's face it, isn't everywhere seen with like the rosiest eyes, right? So, I mean, you were also earlier talking about sort of the sleepwalking, right? Mm -hmm. um, is this also a kind of sleepwalking into, into something? I think these are questions that need to be asked that maybe haven't been asked, um, but, um, you know, is there still time to ask them? Um, I think that um, is a question. Um, and that's not to distract from what both of you were saying about, um, you know, things that Sweden indeed has expertise on, can offer, maybe together with the other Nordics, etc. But there's sort of a couple of things where I think, hmm, there are some other feminist sort of insights about crisis politics, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we might want to apply here. Just a short um, add-on here. And that is that uh, it's clearly Finland that has really sort of driven Sweden um, mm. um, into this into this process. And um, after uh, February 24th, uh, it, uh, up until 7th or 8th of March, uh, the government was very, the Swedish government was very hesitant and was talking about it's, it's important not to rock the boat and to create instability. And then it shifted. And I think it was very much because of um, a, a, social, a social contact and, and, and many visits to Helsinki and also to Brussels and many other capitals together with the Finns. So they actually learned what the Finns were, were thinking about this. And the Finns, they, this is not sort of a crisis mentality. They already got themselves a NATO option in 1995. So they had their big, big debate in the 1990s. So it was so clear from left to right, under certain circumstances, we might join. Wait a minute, it's not that clear. <laughs> As a Finn, I have to say that there was debate and there is there, there was a yeah, there yeah. was a, there, there was a debate, yeah. but look at the look in parliament now. Yeah, parliament, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. but it was so, because of the prizes. So yeah, the but, prizes yeah, but and then... here in Sweden we haven't had a membership debate at all. Mm. Whereas the Finns had an option and they got it already in the 1990s. And that's a big difference. Mm. And that's why the Swe the, the Finns actually moved much faster in this process. And that's because of uh, their exposed, uh, their ge geographic exposure. Mm. There is a long border. With there is a long border. Yeah. 1,300 but do you, kilometers. If I may kind of come back at you then, do you think it's unimaginable that Finland would join and Sweden wouldn't? You know, is it so? I, 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 what would happen then is that the point with non-alignment would, would disappear. Mm. Because what's the point with non-alignment is that you stay out of a conflict. And if, if Finland joins, the first thing the, that, the Na that NATO needs to do if they are to protect Finland is to go through Swedish territory. 
And uh, th this is what the Baltic states have been telling us ever since 2004. And if NATO needs to use Swedish territory, then the Russians, of course, needs to stop that. So we will be involved from, from the first minute if there is a war. And that's why uh, the point of staying out, uh, we, because we will all already be involved. Now we have to end this discussion here for now, and, and we will move on to questions. Are there any questions from, from Twitter? Not Twitter, um, social media, what uh, online? From uh, Zoom, we have several, Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> several questions. Um, and since we're having a meaningful and interesting discussion here, we have not so much time for, there are at least eight or nine Ooh. questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. um, um, so my suggestion is we will we will take all the questions together uh, from from uh, social media what we have and then you can pick what you answer and then we take audience so 15 minutes first we will we have half an hour time we have half an hour left and so we can if if there is if somebody has written the questions already to they're they're long questions so I'm going to start at least with okay. Okay, and um, then you can answer whatever you want uh, from these questions, and then we will move on to, to the audience. So several of them are taking up this issue of, let me just see about what is missing. Uh, let me just get a question for Claire and Anik. What do you think should be happening now that is not happening yet or being properly implemented in the WPS agenda. Um, Are there more that you? There, there are several more. Um, just see, I'm trying to cluster them. Mm -hmm. Why is there such a silence on WPS from the international community? community, given its relevance here, including from NATO, but also from the member states and partners such as Sweden, with, with feminist foreign policies? And what are the implications of this silence for at this critical time for the agenda itself? Let's start Let's from these start, two questions. Start with that, so. and trying to put it in the Ukrainian perspective. Yes. yes. Uh, okay, Please. so um, the uh, sorry, the second question was about sorry, jet lag. What was the second what, question? What should happen now? Okay, yeah. so I, I, I think what you know, what we're seeing missing, and, and I mentioned this before the commitment of, of the feminist foreign policies, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Looking at the 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 sex the trafficking the trafficking of women and girls that we're seeing increasing amount now Ukraine has always been um, and had both as a transit point um, as well as a, a initiation point uh, trafficking of, of women and girls and this is this has always been an issue and it's it's sort of exacerbated through the conflict. We're seeing now the results of that. We're seeing women and girls traffic as they're going over the border. Um, because of the gendered, traditional gendered norms and women are on their own, they're much more at risk. They're seen as, as more vulnerable. Um, so we need to be doing better at, at, at in terms of border control, I, I believe. Um, but also in terms of documentation, like I mentioned, the undocumented, what is happening to them? Um, and this is outside of the traditional responses uh, with, with, with military and the protection of women and girls from sexual violence. Of course, what is happening now, and this is where I think, and I disagree that the international community has been silent. I think the UN has been very um, gauged. I, I think better late than never, the, the Secretary General, UN Secretary General, who, who went to Ukraine. But they've already started the collection of evidence, um, the collect, collecting evidence for the ICC, I hope. Um, uh, but at least looking at the crimes against what could be either humanity, but also the, the rape of not only girls and women, but also men and boys. Um, as we've been hearing, and, and my friend Pramila Patton, the SRSG for on um, sexual violence and conflict, was just there recently. Um, we need to be intensifying this. It's great to see that both Canada and the UK have announced that they're, they're looking at investigating these crimes. We need to elevate, um, because rape and war is not just a byproduct of war. It is a strategic uh, targeting 
of, of people's bodies, men and women and boys and girls. And we need to be elevating this as, as a crime against humanity. Um, and so we can do more in that area. We can do more in terms of humanitarian assistance. We can do more in terms of the humanitarian corridors. We can do more of getting the international community's voices um, about the protection of civilians. Ukraine was one of the uh, first um, uh, partner nations to sign the NATO Protection of Civilians Policy and to be part of that. So, it, you know, recognizing, but I mentioned earlier, recognizing cultural property and protecting that and seeing more emphasis on this. Uh, we do this in Iraq, we do this in Kosovo, we need to be doing this in Ukraine. So I think there's practical things we can be doing and we should be doing them now. I think you already covered quite a lot, but I would probably sort of add something I started with as well, which is to support the local uh, women-led, but also feminist organizations that are actually working on the ground. Um, a lot of them are providing, for example, that sort of first um, help when when a crisis situation hits, whether that is, um, you know, sexualized violence or, or other things, right? Elderly care. I mean, there's a lot of need for for medical uh, assistance as well. Um, and I think the other thing that has come up a couple of times in conversations is um, uh, access to, to shelters and how that is organized. Um, and you know, I think there is a little bit of an issue here also in regards to the trafficking, because like how, how is that organized when people are leaving both within and, and without, so internally and, and externally. And then there's of course the thing that, um, you know, is needs to be stressed in any situation is with that those that are affected need to be part of the conversation about what is needed and and need to be part of um you know sort of through provision of financial resources but also through sort of taking for example caring responsibilities off of of families um whether that's also connected to schooling etc so one of the things that of course has impacted um, people in Ukraine or, or leaving Ukraine as well as the sort of ban on men of certain age leaving, which is, you know, another gendered um, sort of um, issue. Um, and so it means that we are seeing, you know, more than the usual women and children, right? Uh, one word kind of, um, and, and that, that I think is an, is an additional issue to maybe pay attention to. And um, there is a recent report for those listening um, from, uh, that you end, they you ended together with care, rapid gender analysis mm -hmm. of Ukraine has a lot of good recommendations, um, definitely worth uh, looking at. Um, so those, those are some of the things, but I think the, the sort of nothing about us without us, um, you know, that we, we know so well, I think it's really, really important. And, you know, the Ukrainian civil society, um, it's pretty well organized and linked, right? And and even now, it's possible to talk to people. You don't, you know, it's not like in the olden days, like my kids would say, <laughs> when you know you couldn't really get information from the inside. I mean, we see it, obviously, also in Zelensky's broadcasts and stuff. But you know, where where are the women in those conversations? Stephanie, maybe if there is one interesting question. Um... <laughs> Sorry, I, we have to choose because we want to hear our audience here as well. Yes, I think you addressed this about women being excluded from the peace negotiations. Um, another question is, what priori priority areas do you see in support of WPS agenda in Ukraine? How can we support civil society, but also state institutions, local government, and multilateral organizations? Can I just say something about, I'm not going to be popular saying this. But I really hope we don't just focus on women at the peace table, right? I mean, we have to get the war stopped, right? That's the first thing. And this is in the UN, you, you know, you, you've got to go down first, you've got to get that, you've got to get that momentum, you've got to get that agreement. Um, you know, we had a woman at the table in the Normandy talks, uh, Angela Merkel. It doesn't necessarily mean just because we have women in peace processes that we're going to have, and, and I know this is not a popular thought with a lot of people, but when we only concentrate on women in the peace process and not on everything else around the conflict, we are losing out. Because not always do women represent everything else or other women when they're at peace processes, right? And we've seen this in many peace processes throughout the years. 
Yes, we need civil society voices. Yes, we need those who've been affected. But just a random woman at a peace table is not going to change the trajectory of peace. And, and this is what we always come back to. Um, we need every man at that table to be recognizing what happens to women. We need everybody in, 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 when, once we get to a peace agreement and, 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 and hopefully that will be soon. Um, but I think it, it's just too lower hanging fruit for me. And I think it's too easy a cop out to say, whoa, we, need, we just need women at the peace table. We need women in the negotiation. It's not just that. And, and I hope we don't go to that down that rabbit hole because it is a dangerous place to go. And it, it lets everything else um, out the back door. Um, I, I want to comment on that. I, I think often we, we, it would be beneficial to ask if we, if we add women to peace table, what kind of women are we adding? It's just, often it's a token women. So, so what kinds of women? Uh, but everybody knows about everybody's business. As you said, we, we said, need yeah. feminists. We need feminist women who are being affected and understand and represent the voices of, of others. We need, you know, if you're going to have, if you're in a community like Ukraine, you need the diversity. Are you, you going to have women with disabilities? Are you going to, you can't understand unless you're in your, you know, you walk in those shoes. And, and simply by just asking, as we do all the time, we need a woman at the peace table. We need women at the peace table. Well, who is that that we need? Uh, what is that voice of experience going to bring? Um, and and it has it has been tokenism in many many peace uh, peace agreements, if at all. And so it is it is a great um, it, it's a little bit of a prickly subject for me because I really don't like this tokenism that I feel that we often fall to. Um, because it lets us look like we're doing something and then the peace agreement is okay because there's mm -hmm. a woman at the table. Um, so sorry. I'm yeah, no, to... but just to add to that, because I think what you're, you're pointing towards is that actually, you know, it's, it's also about the structure of the negotiations, right? So right now, for example, if you've been following this, the negotiations are kind of a farce. I mean, it's great that there is some conversation happening, but of course, nobody is actually expecting anything really to happen because of those negotiations at the moment, right? So there's also the question of like, okay, so what, what is this table? And, um, you know, what does it mean to sit at this table? So obviously still, I would say, <laughs> greater diversity of voices at the table, probably a good idea, but also who sets the agenda for what's being discussed at the table, right? Um, and those are the maybe at some level, and maybe we are here in a very privileged position where we already are seeing, um, you know, beyond just adding women, um, you know, but this, this question of the agenda itself and, and what is being negotiated at that table and what is not being talked about, right? The silences of that, um, I think are really important as well. Well, I have a question. Um, what would it mean for the WPS agenda if there is a choice between peace and principles? Um, Zelensky says that uh, he, the, the point of departure for any, any peace negotiations is a return to the borders of, of the 23rd of February. Um, uh, let's say that Putin uh, is waging his war so badly that he has to retreat. Uh, and um, is then sort of a WPS negotiator willing to put pressure on Zelensky to give away his point of departure for any peace negotiations? Or uh, because peace is so important? Or is it important not to give away something for the aggressor? That is that to give pieces of land pieces of several cities like Mariupol or, or Kherson in order not to uh, um, encourage um, uh, any aggression for the future. That was, that was the kind of dilemma mm. that faced the negotiators in, in Dayton. Mm. Should, we, should we actually stick to principles or is it more important now to, to stop the killing on the ground for now? Mm. Please don't answer now. Yeah, we want questions. Well, because uh, yeah, my, my point with asking this question is that the, 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 the women or men, the, I mean, these questions are, are full of so, uh, they're mired with so many difficult questions. And uh, so it would be interesting to hear if there's a sort of a specific WPS take on this. Uh, the no. short answer is no, and we'll get to the long answer later. <laughs> okay, uh, questions from the audience, please. 
hands raising. Yes, two hands. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have three questions. And it's uh, your answer. I don't think it's far. I don't think it's far down. Yeah, Hello. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Merci. Uh, I have three questions and it's your answers. So one is for you, <laughs> the man. Magnus. <laughs> Magnus. <laughs> Magnus. Yes. Magnus the man. Yes, Magnus the man. I was thinking that you said it's important that the expectations on gender, if we join NATO, it will come. And I was well, I, th I think many countries believe that this is a profile question for Sweden already now. So I think it's expected that, that Sweden will bring uh, a gender uh, agenda. Yes, into, uh, as and I think this could help the gender issue, really, because I, I totally agree that they will expect Sweden because we are famous for the gender issues. Mm. But I was thinking in the gap that if you get high expectations, mm. it's a pressure, psychological mm. pressure. And what will it bring? And how does the expectations need to be very clear? Or can it be free? Like we don't know about the expectations, but how can we change the whole? What can we? Well, well the, the thing is that uh, I cannot base this on anything more than my personal experiences, because uh, I'm not sure that these expectations are always welcome. Uh, but it's always that Swedes are expected to bring gender issues when there is discussions. Um, so they're not always welcome. But, I, but, but you know, as Claire put it, uh, it's, it's important that we don't take it for granted when we enter those negotiation rooms, uh, because even though we're expected to bring them, maybe we, we take it for granted. So that was just my point that the, the, it's not always welcome to bring up these issues. I, I here here comes the Swedish representative again. Oh yeah, and there's always some gender stuff. No, I think it could help. I have two more questions. Uh, maybe maybe one more question and then we choose one from your two yes. and then yes. we move Quick, on to sorry. the next. Uh, next uh, one more. It's for you if, about the German jackets. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's important because now we change the clothes in the army and mm. we will be more fitted for women. I don't know how it's in Germany, but I was thinking that the coat and the fitting is really important for the brain and to be part of the military in the future. Maybe this would help the gender issue too, maybe. I don't know. Let's take the next yeah. question. Thank you. And then we can, uh, please. Uh, can, can I just, can I just add on to about that? Yes, NATO. please. Yeah. Um, the expectation that, that if Sweden joins NATO and then NATO becomes more, you know, gender friendly, whatever, Remember, it's a consensus-based alliance that Sweden would be one of 31 in a Finland 32. And so they would only have a, a 30th voice. So they can't just suddenly say, we want this to happen. And, you know, we're going to have 50% women at work because you have all those other nations. I think the expectation has to be lowered in terms of what Sweden would be able to do in NATO vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the gender, absolutely be influential because of the wonderful work that's been done. But how much can you shapeshift an organization when it's based on consensus and only consensus? That's a difficult, that's a difficult one. Wonderful point. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pavla Ivanovska from the Nordic Center uh, on Gender and Military Operations. As uh, Ms. Hutchinson mentioned, we are the NATO Department Head for Gender and Military Operations. I think I wanted maybe just to quickly note that there is an architecture in NATO regarding gender perspective. There's a fairly robust and recently updated uh, strategic command directive on gender perspective. And there is a responsibility that goes to all the way up the chain of command on implementing that. Now the question of implementation might be, of course, different from the theory, but just maybe to put that out there that we would not be coming into a vacuum when it comes to gender. Um, I was curious, perhaps primarily from your perspective, Ms. Hutchinson, but of course, everyone else as well, I think when we speak about NATO and WPS, I mean, for the past 15, 20 years, that has been about implementing or exporting it perhaps to a country further away, say Afghanistan. And now it is coming closer, home. Uh, but we're still talking about 
the WPS agenda, what they should be doing in Ukraine. So I guess I just wanted to have your take on once um, this turn to collective defense really kicks in, what would that mean for NATO and the countries in Western Europe when we start, or when we have to start thinking about that more seriously here at home? Thank you. Um, everybody can um, res respond to this question and I can see there's one. One more? Yes, please, one more. Sorry, sorry, Emma. <laughs> okay, hello. Uh, yes, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Friedrichsson. I'm a PhD student in gender, peace, and security here as well. Um, and this might be like a, a difficult and very uh, <laughs> yeah, abstract and out there question, but um, I've just been thinking a lot about the future and like worry, obviously, as everyone else about the future and like where are we going with everything we're talking about more small uh, small arms and large weapons, small arms and large weapons, no, what's it called, uh, south. Uh, in Ukraine, we are talking about the increased fund spending in all of Europe and this like uh, hostility rhetoric and everything. And where will this end? And now also the sanctions that Claire also mentioned, and what will this mean for the future of our relationship with Russia? What will this mean for the Russian population um, and how, and now also like maybe then joining NATO. Um, how do we see our future? What future are we building? Um, so how, like in what way would you say it's possible to have a, a women, peace and security perspective also on our way of dealing with our enemies in quotation marks, but also in relation to Russia? I mean, Russia will be there. Um, so how should we actually think about also the future and the possibilities of creating a sustainable environment to live in? <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Um, we will answer to this question in order. Let's start from Magnus, Claire, and then Anik, and then we will continue discussions after, after the panel. So please, Magnus. What future are we building? It's a, it's you, a... you can pick any of the questions that was presented. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Well, I, I don't think I have much to add to the first question. So um, I think your question is about the response that the, that the Western world is doing right now. And I think uh, it's, it's moving from sort of a, a very, all responses are per definition that you react to something. And I think it was a very emotional reaction. And I think it was driven by a fear of, of splintering the Alliance. So I think that was sort of primary, keep the Alliance together and, and uh, make sure that, the, that the, uh, the Russians don't crush Ukraine. So that, I, th I think we've sort of passed through that phase. And now I think there is a strategic discussion of what kind of uh, sort of next phase response will be. How much complicated arms can we actually meaningfully export to the Ukrainians because they de demand a lot of training and, and a lot of exercises. Uh, how severe should the sanctions be? How much of a price are we in the West willing to pay for that? It's not much so far. Um, and also the Americans are always looking, I mean, one of, uh, one of the major diplomatic concerns has been the relationship to China. So uh, I think the response so far has been sort of driven by panic and, and sort of keeping the alliance together. And the next phase is now sort of looking at different strategic options. But I, I, what I'm missing is some kind of discussion of, of, a, of an end game, because unlike you, I don't put quotation marks when it comes to enemy. Uh, concerning the, the current regime. Uh, um, so uh, there, there needs to be some kind of end game with the, the, the Putin regime. And I see not a lot of, not terribly much discussions about that. Um, and that worries me a bit because if you don't have any ambitions, if you don't have any, any clear outlook of where you wanna go, then you don't really have a strategy. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, so I'm sort of going to put some of these questions together. You know, um, the same as in we didn't go into Afghanistan to save women and girls, and uh, and you know I think likewise with Ukraine. Um, I think there's a different, you know, the different mechanism of what we're looking to deal with. Women, peace, and security has always been an out there, right? The idea that we are going out to save, uh, uh, what did they used to call it? Uh, uh, white men saving brown women. You know, the, the idea that this, uh, this over there um, attitude. And now national action plans, as you know, are changing to be to more about here and now and us. And of course, what is shocking about Ukraine 
which we saw in Bosnia, we saw in Kosovo, but it's in our backyard, right? And, and applying women, peace and security here and now is, is the challenge. And, and that's why maybe we've forgotten a little bit. Maybe we, we think, you know, the, the rules apply on women, peace and security because it's more European. Um, would we have the same oversight on women, peace and security if it was in an African or Asian context? No, we wouldn't. It would be very different. We would be forcing this conversation on women, peace and security. So I think there's a little bit of a disingenuous sort of approach to this. Um, but I think we've recognized that we have to do better within ourselves, both in, in the, the sexual harassment happening in our militaries, as well as the, the, the part, intimate partner violence that's happening, as well as the lack of women's empowerment, the pushback on sexual reproductive health, all of this. Um, we recognize that the political is local, right? That we are part of this and that women's security applies to us. What is gonna happen in the future? Well, I can guarantee that, you know, Russia is not be going to become the center of gender equality expertise. Um, their understanding um, and, and targeting um, of, of women and girls, but their understanding um, of, of gender equality is very, it is very gendered and it has been. And while yes, it may have been uh, within socialism a very forward leaning and women working, there still is, a very, very traditional gender type. And Putin has been, you know, the, 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 he has pushed back hard on rights of LGBTQI as well as on, on, on women's rights. So I think we're not going to see any change in this. So what happens? And that's just a big question mark. Um, you know, where do we go? I'll make one minute. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, let me just wrap it up in one minute. Okay. I, I think, I mean, I, I like the questions because I think they're, they're going across the spectrum, right? We are talking about uniforms and it is still fascinating. I think, was it Switzerland something? Some military recently issued the, for the first time like female underwear too. It's yeah. like, you know, women in the military. It's like, yeah, you might need a bra actually. Um, so we're like on all levels as far as that is concerned. And, um, you know, Sweden not being an exception here either. Um, the jackets were not gender specific. They were just like for cold weather. So that that's um, that's a whole other issue that under sort of preparedness of the Buddhist world. Don't tell them. Um, but um, the, I think the, the sort of question of like the outward lookingness of the Women, Peace and Security agenda and then the National Action Plans has been discussed uh, widely um, by feminist scholars and, and, uh, and others, uh, very well known. And I think you're right, we are sort of moving a little bit. I think we can do a lot more in terms of also, and we have a project here looking at the Swedish Armed Forces from this perspective um, a little bit. Um, so I, I think that that um, definitely is something that um, is kind of happening, that shift is happening. I think the next shift that needs to happen, and I want to mention this before we end, is uh, the sort of also uh, looking at, you know, like taking into account a little bit more um, the sort of intersectional um, perspective here and whether that's, um, you know, sort of I mentioned age, for example, and you mentioned as well the sort of huge elderly population um, in the Ukraine, um, but also the sort of question of imperialism, which have, we have forgotten about, right? And colonial uh, relationships locally and, you know, uh, in the neighborhood as well. So, so, you know, we need to kind of get a little bit away from the idea that we already know how to do this, right? Um, like who is this we and what exactly do we know actually? So, you know, that's a perfect ending for maybe, you know, an academic. <laughs> we need to know more <laughs> it's always good i think it's a very good ending we can say that more discussion is needed and For dialogue sure. will continue among scholars among yeah. practitioners policymakers researchers